Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Thy Strong Word. I'm Pastor A.J. Espinosa. We're reading the entire Bible together out loud, chapter by chapter. Now we are looking at Exodus chapter 37. Was trying to jump the gun yesterday, uh, scaring poor Pastor John Lukomsky. But uh, yes, no, we read 36 yesterday. Today it's 37. So after having read how the actual tabernacle was constructed and and there was that really we talked a lot about that first part in the chapter about how the people were were just changed and they had the spirit of generosity and they freely gave to its construction now we're moving on to the actual furnishing so now you've got the ark and uh, the, the cool cherubim that are on there and the lamp stand and all the rest and so, yeah, so similarly, you know, you look at this chapter and you're thinking, well, I mean, this seems like it's kind of a lot of what we read before. But again, I think there are some interesting differences um, that, that really are con- going to be some cool things to kind of stop and just talk about and think about. And then also there's some other things, too, that we didn't really even have a chance to talk about when it came to each of these things, especially like with the Ark of the Covenant. You know, it's just it, very cool. But so joining us uh, today, well, Lord willing, uh, later we'll have uh, another guest um, coming in, but I'm going to be keeping an eye um, on that. Uh, we're trying to get a hold of him still, but we'll go ahead and proceed because we want to get this thing read. So we'll start with a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, for the life and the gifts and the love and the faith that you keep us in and uh, strengthen us in. Give us now patience and an open mind to seek your truth, to not let our own ideas get in the way, but that you would use all of our experience and creativity and whatever gifts you endowed us with to wrestle with the text and to come to a newer um, and fresher understanding for ourselves that our hearts would be continually transformed by your scriptures. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. So taking a look. uh, Yes. Chapter 37. So yeah, this is just continuing everything that we read before about the construction of the tabernacle. Um, You know, you got the the opening word, you know, Bezalel. Remember, um, he's kind of the, one of these two, uh, it's Bezalel and Aholiab are the two that are put in charge of the construction project. It's not as if they're the only ones that are doing all of this. Um, it said very explicitly back in uh, chapters, I think it was actually in 36, I think it was mentioned in both 36 and 35, um, how you had every craftsman, right? It says here, uh, in whom the Lord had put skill and intelligence. So uh, we, we have more than just these two working on all this stuff. So when, when we hear, you know, he did this or he did that, it's sort of like, uh, you know, he, he oversaw this or had it done, that kind of thing. Oh, and actually here, we, we, I've just been told we, we have our guest for today. So I'll go ahead and introduce him before we get the thing read. So we have today joining us, Pastor Brady Finner, pastor at Messiah Lutheran Church. And how, now how is this? Is it Sartell, Minnesota or Sartell? Probably Sartell, but Sartell, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Sartell. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sartell. Very good. Good morning, brother. Glad you could join us. How are you? I am doing just great. I'm doing just great. Excellent. Very good. Very good. So, yeah, so we're about to dive into chapter 37 here. Um, any preliminary thoughts before we go ahead and read the chapter straight through? You know, I'm going to I'm gonna just going to let you dig in and let's do this. All right, let's do this then. Well said. Okay, here it is from the top, chapter 37. Bezalel made the ark of acacia wood. Two cubits and a half was its length, a cubit and a half its breadth, and a cubit and a half its height. And he overlaid it with pure gold inside and outside and made a molding of gold around it. And he cast for it four rings of gold for its four feet, two rings on its one side and two rings on its other side. And he made poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold and put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark. And he made a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half was its length and a cubit and a half its breadth. And he made two cherubim of gold. He made them of hammered work on the two ends of the mercy seat, one cherub on the one end and one cherub on the other end. Of one piece with the mercy seat, he made the cherubim on its two ends. The cherubim spread out their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings, with their faces one to the other, toward the mercy seat where the faces of the cherubim. He also made the table of acacia wood. 
two cubits was its length, a cubit its breadth, and a cubit it half, and a cubit and a half its height. And he overlaid it with pure gold and made a molding of gold around it. And he made a rim around it with handbreadth wide and made a molding of gold around the rim. He cast for it four rings of gold and fastened the rings to the four corners and at its four legs. Close to the frame were the rings as holders for the poles to carry the table. He made the poles of acacia wood to carry the table and overlaid them with gold. And he made the vessels of pure gold that were to be on the table, its plates and dishes for incense and its bowls and flagons with which to pour drink offerings. He also made the lampstand of pure gold. He made the lampstand of hammered work. Its base, its stem, its cups, its calyxes, and its flowers were of one piece with it. And there were six branches going out of its sides, three branches of the lampstand out of the one side of it, and three branches of the lampstand out of the other side of it. Three cups made like almond blossoms, each with calyx and flower on one branch, and three cups made like almond blossoms, each with calyx and flower on the other branch. So for the six branches going out of the lampstand. And on the lampstand itself were four cups made like almond blossoms with their calyxes and flowers and a calyx of one piece with with it under each pair of the six branches going out of it. Their calyxes and their branches were of one piece with it. The whole of it was a single piece of hammered work of pure gold, and he made it seven lamps and its tongs and its trays of pure gold. He made it and all its utensils out of a talent of pure gold. He made the altar of incense of acacia wood. Its length was a cubit, its breadth was a cubit. It was square, and two cubits was its height. Its horns were of one piece with it. He overlaid it with pure gold, its top and around its sides and its horns, and he made a molding of gold around it, and made two rings of gold on it under its molding on two opposite sides of it as holders for the poles with which to carry it. And he made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. He made the holy anointing oil also, and the pure fragrant incense, blended as by the perfumer. All right. So so there we go. And like I was saying beforehand, it seems uh, a lot like uh, what we've read before, like, uh, and where, where was it? It was back in, uh, was it, was it chapter 25? So, you know, it sounds in, in many cases, you know, word for word, the same as what you had in Exodus chapter 25. Um, even like these little like uh, fra- phrases about th- that seemed kind of redundant about the cherubim facing each other or things of being of one piece, uh, all, all those things just almost like straight out of 25. But there are these like little differences here. And whenever you, those those show up, like my eyebrow was kind of like going up a little bit like, hmm. Um, but, but yeah, just ov- overall, what, what, do you, what are your thoughts? You know, I'm going to have to recenter myself. I lost you about halfway. Where are we at again? Ah, <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Um, so we're, we're here in Exodus 37, and we just read through the whole chapter just to kind of not miss the forest for the trees. And so that included the, the description of the, the ark as well as the table and the lampstand and, um, and the altar of incense. And at the very end, this is kind of like a really very summary statement of the actual oil in, that would go um, on the incense table. So we just kind of read through all those. And so we're just kind of thinking, you know, so what, what's kind of, you know, standing out uh, as a whole uh, when you kind of put all the pieces together and take a step back? Yeah, so when you look at this, it really brings you back to the intricate nature of worship, you know, yeah. um, making the ark, showing that when you're in the presence of um, when you're in the presence of God, that this is serious business. And you see this when you look at um, throughout this, you have the incense showing not only the understanding of the presence of God, but prayer. You're looking at the lampstands and the table. Um, it shows us the intricate nature of worship, which we see today even. When you go into a, a, a worship setting, um, we call it the nave, and you have the sanctuary, and you have um, where the holy of holies, if you will, that it really reminds us of how where we worship is important because it preaches a sermon, if you will, about yeah. what we're they're doing and uh 
uh, uh, making the ark and everything that goes with it. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's, um, I, I think there is something there that there, there is kind of like a, a sermon in the midst of all this when you uh, look at all the, all the details that, um, yeah, and, and I think, uh, well, I mean, in fact, it just reminds me of how many times for the children's message, you know, which is uh, something that I, I don't, I don't think I've ever seen that in a, one of our, I, I don't think it's like, it's actually in one of like Lutheran service books, like divine service settings, like, and now the children's message. Um, but, you know, it's like something that just so many of us do. And, and for those children's messages, uh, very often I've just picked things in the sanctuary, you know. And I said, hey, kids, look at this. You know what this is? Or why does this thing have eight sides? Or, you know, why is it this color? And, and yeah, there's, it's, just, it's just full of meaning and depth. And um, it's just really something. And we, we talked about this, too, when we we're thinking about the, um, the garments for the priests, how just all those, those details, they're, they're all so deliberate. Yes, yeah, so some of them are practical, uh, you know, and, and like we saw that the tabernacle itself gets covered with, you know, like a, a layer of like uh, goat skin. Um, just so it's like waterproof, right? But um, a lot of the details are just uh, very aesthetic and symbolic. Very much so. And I think you have an emphasis on gold, which I yeah. appreciated as you look through that. I guess I never really caught that. But then that brings us, you know, really looking at uh, uh, whenever there is a, a look of heaven, and you yeah. look at the New Jerusalem, and you look at it, there's always these very fine jewels that are being used. And um, mm-hmm. and that's something, you know, that connects back to how we worship today, that um, that the, the holiness of, of heaven is coming to us now. And that's something that you can tell that when you first read this, as you've been doing a few chapters before this, is that yeah. we are like, what's up all the details? I mean, why so many details? Well, I hope we never yeah. do that to the person who builds our house. You know, like, oh, why all the <laughs> details just make my house, you know? But here, yeah, right. showing how, in, in many ways, pointing them to, the, to uh, what, uh, to give you a glimpse of what heaven will be. I mean, we talk about this a lot um, when it comes to the liturgy and, and why it's good to have order and why all those things come to us, and it almost explicitly comes down to the reality that um, heaven is going to be amazing, and you you look at the gold, and you look at um, the rings, and you look at all these things, and how intricate they were, it wasn't just um, to look fancy, because that's the problem you've had throughout the church, iconoclasm, um, looking at those things instead of God himself, but you are reminded of that glimpse of what it will be like in heaven. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. That especially the gold uh, indicates or is symbolic of that, that nearer presence of God. Uh, Like we saw in the description of the, the tabernacle, how in the inner parts um, of the tabernacle, the, the, uh, well, you had gold, and then you had the uh, the bases of things that were on the ground. It was silver. Um, and then, like, going towards the outside, everything starts getting made of rather than, than gold on top and then silver on the bottom. But um, you had silver on top and then uh, bronze on the bottom. Um, so, so the idea of kind of, like, you know, you're, you're kind of going down. As you get further and further away from God, the, the metals become um, less and less precious. Of course, bronze still being a, a valuable metal, um, but but yeah, the idea of just kind of you know the closer you are to this ark, the closer you are to um, heaven, right? The closer you are to God, that just kind of like intuitive sense of God being near, um, and it is it is very striking the way that there is just so much gold. I mean, just everything gold when it comes to the Ark of the Covenant and and then um, in particular to this this lampstand, uh, which is actually, you know, unlike some of the other things, uh, not made of acacia wood and overlaid with gold, but the thing is actually made of pure gold itself, the whole thing. Um, and, and you get actually, and there is, I think that is a comment that stands out, I think, as a difference um, where it says there, he made it in all its utensils, um, out of a talent of pure gold, I am not sure if that's just going off of what I recall. 
if that was in Exodus 20, um, uh, well, I guess, no, I, I guess, I guess it, it did, it did get, like, got said back in Exodus 25, um, 39, it shall be made with all these utensils out of a talent of pure gold. Yeah. Yeah. But, but you have that, like that summary statement there, which I think kind of just emphasizes how much gold's being used. It's, it's kind of a lot, <laughs> it's like 75 pounds of gold. Yeah. And you, it's hard to imagine how much that would have cost, you know, it's hard enough yeah. to build a building. <laughs> and then you think about all the intricate details that go with that. I yeah. also think about, um, there's two things I'm thinking about right now is first of all, the, the cherubim and yeah. the importance of angels, you know, throughout the Bible. And, uh, when you look at, you know, cherubim, and seraphim, and you look at, you know, Isaiah six, uh, you look at other times where you have these angels are a part of this showing the intricate nature of God's presence and the angels. And I was looking at this yeah. when it comes to um, Luther's morning prayer, you know, um, that your holy angel will be with me, that the evil fool may not, um, um, I'm sorry, my mind's slipping me a little bit, but it, the, the, the evil fool may not uh, overcome me. And, uh, and, and no power and over me, yeah. May power over I, I'm thinking of different translations. I've been looking at numerous ones. And anyways, so oh, yeah, yeah. that one of those things, too, that you look at, here is the... Um, here is the presence of God, I mean, literally, for people, and it, it becomes a battle later on in the Bible, um, in the Old Testament. But here you have that cherubim as a, um, I don't have to dig into it deeper, because I wasn't really able to, is to understand yeah. the intricate nature of angels and God and His presence, and how they're working for Him, they're working for us, and how important right. that is in our culture, where it gets, it, angels kind of become almost the God. Like, I know my my angels watching over me. Um, yeah. And so that's something I think is very powerful when you look at the rest of the narrative um, of why that is an important part of God's work, his presence and how he's continually working to protect us from the evil one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that last thing that you said that, you know, kind of angels end up kind of becoming gods on their own in popular culture, that, that, that kind of, I think that's pretty interesting. Um, I think I think there's always something to that, though. Um, of course, when you when you look at the Old Testament, um, the the angels in some places are called um, the sons of God or, or the sons of the Most High, and you see how each one of them is associated with one of the the rulers of the earth, especially in Daniel, right? Like how there's a you know there's there's an angel in each of these places, and um, that that's interesting because that is a pretty close parallel with basically all the paganism around uh, Israel, which would have said that these were not angels, but gods themselves, right? So, so it is really interesting how um, th there was this distinction that in paganism, these are gods, and the Hebrew faith, they're angels. That is to say, they're merely messengers of the one true God. Um, not necessarily just messengers, but as you were saying, um, you know, protectors, um, you know, watchmen, um, and, and, and all the rest. And it, it's just kind of interesting, though, how I, I feel like outside of the faith, angels, yeah, basically are God in this kind of like polytheistic sense, right? Because like, what, what, do you, what do you take, right, when you, when you have the idea of God, but you disconnect it really from the scriptures. Well, well, God is, you know, he's, he's out there, he's, he's watching, he's protecting, you know, I mean, I mean, it's, it's kind of like we kind of reduce God to, you know, some kind of like guardian angel idea. So, um, yeah, I mean like the, the place of angels in, in Hebrew theology, um, is really distinctive how they are, they're subordinated and, and just, yeah, like how, how they have, um, they're facing God in this way, right? I, I think, I think probably if we didn't spell this out, but I think probably in a position of uh, prostration, that is to say that they're bowing down and that's just, that's very distinctive. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it, it's something, cause I find it interesting when you look at, as you make in the art that uh, it, their, their wings overshadow the mercy. Right. Um, facing each other. And just, I, I don't know, I, I just feel this wrapping around and the whole ministry that is happening. Um, 
uh, and and the and, you know you have to be careful not to make them um, the gods, but they are are so important, especially when you think of the Lord of Hosts. You know that kind yeah. of language that uh, that they are. It's just like an army, an army fighting for you. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And and, and, and I, I don't know. I you know that's something you could have a whole just talk about angels. And, oh and yeah, yeah, to- them, easily. Obviously, the fallen angels and and people. No. Whenever I do a Bible study in angels, it, it, it <laughs> I, I've never. And this is something I reflected on is I've never yeah. connected it back to the ark itself and how yeah. important it was of angels in the Old Testament because we almost always connect it to um, Jesus. You know, the pre-incarnate Christ. Right. coming to uh, his people, but to think of it as the angels were a part of how God worked in the Old Testament, I, I, that, that really struck me during this time. Well, yeah, and, and uh, actually when we were reading um, Exodus chapter 25, we talked about cherub, uh, cherubs or cherubim a little bit. Um, you know, the, the first time that they occur in, in the Old Testament is in the context of uh the, the fall and that you get in Exodus chapter or Genesis chapter three and that God places cherubim and a flaming sword uh, to guard the, the garden of Eden. And it seems like, um, you know, the word itself isn't really suggestive of anything too in particular, except that maybe they're kind of like the, the people that you run or the, the angels that you would run into first when you're about to enter a place or see somebody, that's to say that they're basically guards or, you know, like they're kind of, um, you know uh, what you might say, like I don't know, the bouncers, right? Who, <laughs> like, they're not going to let you in unless you've, you've got credentials, right? So that that seems to sort of be their fun their function. And so by having these these cherubs or cherubim uh, flanking the presence of God, it, it's it's very much the same thing. I think that you know, hey, you're in the presence of God of God, and there are these angels guarding. And if you um, aren't the right person watch out right i mean and i think that that got um really kind of spelled out too when we saw how the the high priest there's this very like specific um kind of washing and very specific garment that he has to wear um at this specific time of year if he's going to go into the holy of holies and and we read how and it was really (laughs) it was pretty interesting how there are these bells on um on, on his garment that are like shaped like pomegranates um, and there's supposed to be this sound that goes off. And it actually says there in the text, this was a few chapters earlier, that um, th- that when Aaron, then the high priest, is wearing this and, and that bell sound happens, well, then he won't die when he goes in or when he goes out. And why would that be? Well, because there are cherubs there that would kill him if he wasn't the high priest. I, I mean, I, mean I, I think that it's kind of underscoring that heavenly reality that you have this kind of visual manifestation of it. You really do. Yeah, you really do. And this is all setting up the reality um, that I know you've talked about, too, is that no one can see God and live. And so part of this is showing uh, the need for each person, one, to to do the right things uh, when they come to worship. And, And with that is a realization of, as we know throughout the Bible, that I'm not worthy to be in the presence of God. Right. Um, and yeah. one time I had somebody uh, in my church, she was going through cancer treatment. And so she was not able to work for a few months and she started reading the old Testament and, yeah. and she's a beloved lady and she reads it. And when she's reading it, she couldn't believe it. she goes to Leviticus and you know Exodus. I mean, clearly, and then go to Leviticus and as other places, and, and she says at the, at the end of it, she goes, you know, I'm always amazed at all the rules and the, the, um, uh, the, regu- the regulations. She was a social worker, so she knew regulations. <laughs> and she <laughs> said, when I got done with it, when I got done, I realized how much, uh, how much Jesus was willing to go for, through, for me, uh, to go through mm-hmm. for me, because all these things remind us of how we don't deserve to be with God, but yet on account of Christ, um, he, he, he gave us that gift. So we don't have to be looking at these things in the same way. And that's where yeah. uh, how we started this, is that reality of all these details point us, one, our realization of our own need for um, help, at the very least, and the full fulfillment of Christ. And that's how you filter through um, yeah. 
the, the ark, the tabernacle, um, the lampstand, and all of that because we're able to look at it with comfort as opposed to more fear. Yeah, that, that's a really, I want to develop that thought more because I think that's one of the real big ideas that comes out in this chapter, but we, we're already a little bit over time. So everybody hold on, we're going to take our break here, but we'll be right back looking at Exodus 37 on Thy Strong Word. Be right back. <laughs> I'm Pastor Ken Bomberger. Join me weekday mornings at 7.15 for Orazio, your time of scripture, meditation, and music on KFUO, Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Hello, this is Dr. Dale Meyer. Have you heard Concordia Seminary's program, Word and Work and Intersection? Every week, you can hear it on KFUO Thursdays at 2 p.m. Central Time. We visit with many interesting guests about how the Word of God applies to their daily vocations and ministries. Be sure to tune in, and may the intersection of Word and Work be busy on your corner. You hear our voices every day as we speak the gospel, share the latest news, or for insightful and sometimes entertaining talk. Why not share your voice with us and send us your feedback, suggestions, and questions? Leave your comment at 314-996-1542. Be sure to follow us on social media, too, so you can like, comment, and share your favorite posts. Drop an email to KFUO at KFUO.org or send a snail mail letter to Worldwide KFUO, 1333 South Kirkwood Road, St. Louis, Missouri, 63122. Welcome back, everybody, to Thy Strong Word. I'm Pastor A.J. Espinosa. We're looking at Exodus chapter 37 today, joined uh, by our guest here, by God's grace. We got him. We lost him for a second, but we got him back. And Lord willing, it, uh, the connection holds up. We've got Pastor Brady Finner, Pastor at Messiah <laughs> Lutheran Church in Sar- Sartell, Minnesota. I'm getting your your last name, too, right? It, it, they're both stressed yep. on the first syllable, Finner. Um, Pastor Finner, yes, yes, sir. Yeah, ver, ver, very good, very good. And so, yeah, we were just talking about this and kind of one of the big ideas here, how all these details are reminders of how we are unworthy to be in God's presence um, and, and really pointing to our, our great need. And then also, conversely, God's great grace that despite that, he still comes into our presence. I, I mean, there's, there, I mean, just there's the two sides of grace, right? Um, and there's a question that came in um, online that I wanted to kind of get at in just a second. But I want to invite everybody who is listening live. You can join the conversation here if you've got any questions or comments. One eight hundred seven three zero two seven two seven, or if you're in St. Louis, three one four eight two one zero eight five zero. You can also send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org or hop on the live stream, facebook.com slash AJ Espinosa. So as did uh, John, uh, who was saying, you know, hey, so all this repetition that we've got here in chapter 37, um, is it maybe that this is kind of reinforcing um, everything that happened in light of the golden calf incident? Um, that uh, on, on the one hand, that... Uh, you know, th- this is like this repetition, this reaffirmation, right, that uh, God is, uh, he's still going to do this. He's still committed to the plan. You know, he, he is He is faithful even when we are not. The idea of like hesed, rav hesed in the Hebrew. Um, mm. Yeah, I, I think I think that's right. I think it's God expressing his His commitment and that all the details are the same. It's not like they, they get like a mini arc. Or like, you know, arc light, diet arc, you know, it looks like, well, you kind of get some of my presence now. You're not going to get my whole presence anymore because you guys messed up. No, like it, it, that doesn't happen. Um, and on the other hand, it's it's uh, repentance, right? That, you know, hey, we, we, we did this 
wrong and now we're we're going to by god's spirit right like that was the, what we had in the previous chapter that the spirit was stirred up in people right um now that they're now they're going to do this right and i and i think that's i think that's right because there, there were these uh two there were really two elements that we, we kind of underappreciate with when it comes to the golden calf incident that one it was actually a festival right like they, they had this festival and it was a very particular kind of festival that was very pagan and very not in line with the sixth commandment, we'll say. Um, and, and so, and so right after that, right in, in Exodus, uh, 30, what was it? 35. Um, you, you get mm-hmm. God when he's reiterating everything, what's he saying? Okay, guys, these are my festivals. It's the Sabbath. It's the, it's the feast of ingathering. It's the feast of weeks. And it's the feast of unleavened bread. Those are my festivals. No bail festivals. Okay. Um, and then, then mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. Like the next thing that you get kind of being reiterated in some ways is the tabernacle, and these things in the tabernacle. She was like, okay, look, we got the tabernacle. We've got the, uh, the, the, the bread table, the incense table, the altar, and the Ark of the Covenant. Not any golden calves, right? I didn't say golden calf in that list, right? So you, you, you can, I think, kind of read this as, uh, I think, a kind of repetition that's just clarifying it um, and just repeating it, saying, these are the parts that we got wrong, but by God's grace, with the Spirit, we can do it right. Only, only because it's God doing it in us. What do you think? You know, that's a great. That's a great. I've never thought about the connection of the golden calf and the tabernacle. Well, definitely um, the making of the ark, in the sense that re-steering the ship, if you will. Um, yeah. Without really, necess- I mean, he he clearly cleaned house, you know, on the golden calf situation. But when all the dust settles, you know, the people who are faithful, we all need a reminder. Okay, okay, what's the next step? I mean, this goes back to the Vince Lombardi um, quote. You know, they lose a game, and Vince Lombardi says, "Hey, you know, guys, we need to figure out." Um, the basics again, and so he begins by lift up a football and says, gentlemen, this is a football. <laughs> and I really would see that here, is that he's pulled and telling them, okay, clearly that was wrong worship. You knew it, but as we all get redirected to faith, uh, I, I say redirected from faith and where scripture stands, it's really like he's just starting confirmation over. You know, he's starting it all over to show them, yeah. okay, Here's where I am. Here's where my presence is. For example, here are the angels that we're talking about. Here's the lampstand, which will show you, and, and the altar of incense. All of these things, and right. they clearly point you back to me. Right. Yeah. No, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, and, and he, he kind of does go back to, okay, gentlemen, this is a football, right? Because he, he gives them the, the Ten Commandments over again. Um, mm-hmm. Right, though, though, of course, I mean, mm-hmm. the other side of the significance there is that, of course, like they, they broke the covenant, and that was symbolically <laughs> broken by Moses, showing what they had done. Uh, but, but you can kind of say, like, yeah, it's kind of like we're going back to the basics, and uh, you know, how true is that? You know, that's what Luther said that he, you know, he, he was a doctor in theology, but he said he never could master the catechism. I mean, he was always going back to the Ten Commandments. Like the day that you think that, like, okay. Ten Commandments, that's kid stuff, let's move on. That's that's the day that you're fooling yourself and you you're really going on to something that's that's not the Christian faith anymore. Like there there's no mastering those things. Like the the basics have have always got to be before you. Uh so yeah, I think that I think that's there. You know, gentlemen, you know, this is a football. But then but then yeah, kind of interestingly kind of focusing on these aspects that we got wrong. Like, okay, these are the parts that we got wrong, so these are the parts that we're gonna review. Um, I mean, like, you can do the same thing, right? Speaking of, like, catechesis and memorization, right? I mean, it, it's the parts that you have trouble on. Like, those are the parts you've got to review more times. And so uh, they messed up with a festival, and they messed up with what they made out of gold. And so now we're going to focus on festivals and what you make out of gold. Um, you know, and it kind of makes a lot of sense when you read it that way. It really does. And, and you know, you think of it as golden calf. And I never made this connection either. In the beginning, I kind of just focused on 37 and thinking of oh, there was a golden calf, and that clearly was, was not me. <laughs> that was not towards me. And here is how you can appropriately use gold. And I think right. that, that, that connects us clearly to the first commandment. And you think about um, we, we have a tendency to become pietistic or pietism, which is the understanding of 
that thing there is inherently bad, so don't do it. Yeah. So, for example, growing up, my grandmother grew up in the world where if you go to a dance, that's evil. If you if you play cards, yeah. that's evil. If you have some wine, that's evil. Right. And and it's just a reminder too. Here's how to appropriately use that. And this is how you can appropriately dance. This is how you can appropriately play cards and so forth, or, or yeah. to enjoy um, those kind of things. And so that here it is. This is the appropriate way. Um, not only the order of which to worship, but also how to use the gifts that God gives us in creation for His glory. Yeah, th- that that's a, that's a really good point there too. With 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 Pietism, that um, you know, yeah, that, that there are no things that are just evil, um, and then there's good things and bad things, and so you know, we got to like get as many of the good things as possible, but avoid all the bad things. Um, I mean, yeah, yeah, you, you use the word Pietism, and, and in, the, in the Christian context, that's kind of how we fall off the fall off the wagon there but uh, i mean re- really kind of broadly speaking that's just paganism polytheism um that you know mm. you've got things that the gods are aligned with that the gods like and then you got stuff that the gods don't like not that they're not aligned with um and that's just kind of how basic polytheism paganism has always worked and kind of always does even kind of that kind of basic like you were saying that kind of kind of functional paganism or polytheism where you just kind of turn God into a mere angel or uh, merely a, a, an assortment of angels, right? That even with even without developed theology, that's kind of what the heart does. Uh, you kind of say good stuff, bad stuff. Well, I get lots of the good stuff. I'll be fine. But yeah, but this is the, the, the creator God who is creator of all things. And so there are no uh, good things and bad things. He made everything good. It's a matter of are you using it the way that God made it to be? Or are you coming mm-hmm. up with some other way of using it? Which... I think is reflected too that kind of that creator um, imagery in the text. I mean, we saw how, yeah, in the description of the Ark of the Covenant, yeah, you have very much, um, you know, this with the cherubs there, just very, very prominent. Um, you know, they are subordinated, right? They're they are bowing. Um, you know, they overshadow. It says the mercy seat, which is interesting because they're, they're they're like covering God, which I think you know goes back to your point that it's like. Hey, th- this is like the the ultimate um, creator God. You, you've got to like hide yourself. We think of like Moses yeah, um, yeah. And, and the Rock, right? Like we didn't. I, I, we haven't had a chance to talk about this, but it was it was actually only like in the last like week that I think I put the dots together on that. That hang on a second. Why was Moses's face shining when he went down the the mountain the second time, but not the first? Doesn't mention it with the first. Was well, because the right. second time. God let his glory pass by him when he was hiding in the rock, right? Like you think of like, a, the, uh, and I think I've used this analogy before, my four-year-old likes these glow-in-the-dark things. So she has a glow-in-the-dark ducky. But, but I tell her, right, you've, you've got to charge it up, right? You've got to like let it sit in the light. Um, and then that charges it up and then it glows. If you don't do that, if you just leave it like in the dark in your closet, it's not going to light up for you at night. And so it's like the same thing that like, you know, there's Moses hiding in the rock and just the, this hiding like glance by like here's his back view right when he moves his hand away is enough to light up his face for, you know, presumably hours. I mean, I mean, just just think about that. How I mean, I mean, these sorts of details just point to God's supremacy as the Creator. You know that it there was a that is, that is really good because it, it connects us to once again God once showing that He's going to be with His people. I mean, if you were to go through the Golden Calf um, incident, you would really worry. Wait, maybe God is no longer with us. He forgot yeah. us, or He left us. And then you know there He comes. They come to Moses. And then God gives more instructions on how he will continue to be with you. And that is, I mean, it's such a theme, obviously, biblically, of, of being Emmanuel and, and, and his presence with his people, reaffirming the covenant with them. You know, this is a, definitely a theme, a theme throughout Exodus as well. That he reminds us of that, and he shows, okay, and here is where you'll know that I'll be when he talks yep. about the ark and the... And that, and that connects to us in uh, a few ways. Like you said, when God's presence came, it changed him, as it does for us. You know, when, when we're in the Word, the Holy Spirit changes us from the Spirit, Galatians 5, um, changes us to, to see that He's with us. And then just that reminder of uh, the kind of the sac- very much of the sacramental nature of the Old Testament, that there is God's presence, and you can, um, there it is physically. 
Yeah. Well, no, yeah, certainly. I mean, and, and that's, uh, yeah, that, that's not like the, like you're saying, like that's not some kind of primitive idea that we outgrew that like, oh, God is present in this spot. Well, what do you mean? Uh, you know, God is, God is omnipresent. Oh, you know, what, what, what is, what is that about? No, no, well, yes, he's, he's omnipresent, but like, you know, actually I remember, I remember, uh, trying to like kind of explain this like from, uh, for, for my conference, like, you know, when we talk about omnipresence, like it, it's kind of like what the psalmist says that, you know, if I were to go to the farthest reaches of the sea or the, the deepest depths of the earth, you know, I, I could not, there you would be right. You there, like Jonah, right? You, you can't, you can't even go into the sea and get swallowed by a fish. Uh, and then somehow you've escaped God's presence. Omnipresence really kind of in the story of the old Testament, um, and the New Testament means there, there's no escaping God. There, there's no getting away from him. There's no hiding from him, right? Um, on the other hand, it doesn't rule out that God can't be especially uh, present in a certain way, whether whether for the for judgment or for, for blessing, you know? So the, the, the two are not actually um, incompatible, right? Like any more than, I don't know, the, the, the fact that I can— yeah, on the one hand, for instance, right, like everyone here can like hear my voice. And so like in, in a sense, like my, my presence is is being broadcast all over the place. And yet um, I'm actually um, <laughs> well, right now I'm like here in my home office. Right. Like so there's like a difference and that's mm-hmm. not actually like a contradiction, though. Uh, and so, yeah, like and, and so we don't we don't outgrow that and say, oh, well, that's that's a you know, Hebrew superstition. But no, we. In fact, we celebrate it with the Lord's Supper and we say, yeah, you know, we're, everything is in God's presence. Everything is before the creator. He, he sees all, knows all, but he's made himself especially present here, not in the Ark of the Covenant, but, well, in, in the truest sanctuary, which is his son, Jesus Christ, and his body and blood. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And uh, one, one which I would like to go is to the, uh, the altar of incense. Oh, yeah. And um, and with that comes what I think is one of the more powerful connections that you see from the Old Testament to the New Testament, and that is the realm of prayer. You know, as we know from um, uh, Psalm 141, but that prayer rises up before you as incense. Yeah. And there's a number of things with that. We, in our culture, have a number of problems that we, we tend to look at that as like a real high... Um, church thing, maybe Catholics do, and then therefore it's yeah. not right for some reason. Um, and in the same yeah. token, it can be connected to a hippie world, you know? <laughs> yeah, <of> sure. <laughs> and then on top of that is just allergies. You know, like people just have allergies because there's been times sure. that I have used incense. And yeah. we've, we've stopped that because of allergies. But to make that connection of not so much the incense itself, what it what it shows us, which is prayer, and so we often will look at this and say, "Oh, um, this is prayer." Uh, that that oh, it's just that kind of nice. It shows us symbolism. Or people go to church and they see it and they don't get it. And but to be able to always connect that back to prayer, where you're taking these things to the Lord and it's it lifted up literally to Him, just like incense flows up into heaven. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that is. Yeah, good. Well, well, I was gonna, I was gonna say it, it is it is it is striking because that is I think maybe one of the the differences that kind of stands out here um, when when we're talking about like you know comparing Genesis or uh, Exodus uh, twenty six with um with what what we have here because yeah you back in Exodus twenty six you had the uh, the description of, of uh, how to build the tabernacle with like all the, the clasps and the curtains and all the rest, which we read last time in Exodus 36. Um, and then, you know, after that, you get into the description of uh, the, uh, the, the actual Ark of the, uh, the Covenant. And, um, you know, so you have those things that you relayed before, but here you, you do actually have... Um, this little description at the end about specifically the the incense. He made the holy anointing oil also and the pure incense blended as by the perfumer. And so you just get this, this little bit there. And so it's like, we, we couldn't leave this out, um, even though technically it's not one of the furnishings that, you know, you know it's just kind of interesting. It actually kind of struck me that, you know, I guess these the Basilel and Holyab, they're supposed to be like kind of these like master, master craftsmen or something like that. Um, mm-hmm. They're not really so much 
uh, perfumers. <laughs> um, like it seems like a kind of different <laughs> occupation, but but yeah, it says you know he made the holy anointing oil also and the pure fragrant incense, which which I have to take to mean he like had someone make right? <laughs> like he was like okay. Hey guys, everything's good. You can go ahead and make the incense and put it on the table. You, you know, like, like, like he, he mm. directed it. Not necessarily that, like, he did like everything himself. Like he's like micromanaging. But like, just, that's just kind of interesting. That you know, it's like you can't leave this out. You can't leave out the the scent. It, like, it's almost like saying, you know, all this stuff that we were building, like, well, something doesn't smell right. Like, like you know, it's like it wouldn't it wouldn't be right unless it had this characteristic scent. You know, and and I feel like that it kind of just. Right. Uh, underscores how like the scent is just as important as the the look and the feel right right and and i'll connect it to back back a little bit to our own personal um i don't want to say this experience is that there's times where um certain times of year like i would say august is the time of year and we get to that time of year where there's a certain smell that if you played football or something or in the summer you know baseball and um, if you play certain sports or if you live in a farming yeah. community, that there's smells that you'll have and it brings back the memories. Yeah. And here, you know, and here and throughout the rest of this time, this incense, you know, you'd smell it and you'd know, like you say, it's kind of weird that they really emphasize this and you have yeah. um, these holders and these others. But there was a very big worshipful, um, that's the wrong word, but a worship component to this. Don't bring you back, and and just think about how many times God goes back. Says, "I'm the one who brought you out of, out of, out of uh, Egypt. I'm the one who brought you out of this. I am the God of of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and did all that remembering. And then He brings the physical aspect into it, which is yeah. just, I mean, it's so it's a wonderful sacrament. Not, I know don't get a sacramental understanding. I would say in a physical sense that He brings yeah. those um, senses all into it for the sake of giving Him the glory and receiving His gifts." Yeah, well, you know, and I think that that is really interesting how, I mean, the the sense of smell, like, just, it does just occupy this really unique place, right, like, among our senses and how, um, you know, I'm, I'm by no means any expert on this, but I've just, like, heard things that, like, you know, like, for some reason, it's, like, something about scent, like, the, the way it's connected to memory is just, in, in a way, like, almost unlike any other, and it is weird, I feel like, I feel like we all can kind of attest to that, how, you go through life and you get you, you smell something and you just you just get these feelings just kind of come back to you like 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 maybe it's a good feeling or like 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 a warm one or or maybe even a fearful one and you can't even remember why or like what it's connected to at first right and you're like this is reminding me and then like you know you kind of keep thinking about like I don't know why but this reminds me of grandma you know and, and you and you're just like you you don't you can't even place it right and you're kind of going back and and finally you're like because it smells like grandma's kitchen when she would lay out the fresh flour tortillas, you know, like, and it's just mm -hmm. kind of amazing how those smells just stick with you and they make those memories so vivid. And so in this chapter and in these chapters that seem to be so much about, Hey guys, this is the stuff that we got wrong. Don't forget what God said. Let's remember the, the parts that God said that we seem to be struggling with here, everybody. Yeah, it, it makes sense that this that this scent um, stands out, like you know, so that I mean, just think about that, right? Like that way, they wind up in a, in a certain in a, a certain kind of setup, right? A certain kind of worship context, and they're kind of like, well, I'm not sure it's uh, something's kind of different. Well, it'll just smell wrong, right? Like by by mm -hmm. <laughs> by by having this particular scent that's like only used right for the tabernacle, it's like they'll they'll go into this worship setting and they'll like doesn't, doesn't smell right. I'm I'm out of here, right? I mean, isn't that just fascinating how God would just very mercifully and very um, accommodatingly as the creator kind of like just kind of give that to us as like a, as a kind of a trademark or a, or a stamp or just kind of like something that will, you know, set off a, a alarm bells or a red flag for us. Absolutely. And, and you think about how often, um, you know, they go into the land of Canaan and they say, put up these, you know, stones, um, just the continuously, uh, the continuous opportunity to remember what God has done, and He uses us specifically through this. And I would call it a, a call, a call to a call to pray, a call to worship. Like here's that smell. Here we go. Um, let's do this. Let's bring this again to God. God's the one who's given us all these things. 
And God's the one who will continue to provide through all these things. Because, it, 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 I mean, we get very frustrated with the Israelites as they complain when they didn't have water or they didn't, you know, didn't have the supposed great life that they had in, in yeah. Egypt. And it's easy to get frustrated with them. But they needed reminders like we need reminders every single day of God's grace and, and His forgiveness and His presence. And that's why I do think it's important, even though I would admit if I, um, it is important to go through these verses and these chapters. I would admit that a lot of times if you go through Exodus, you kind of get to 20 and then you're like, oh, okay, 32 and uh, okay, right at the end. And it is important to go through these to remind us of how God reminds us to remember Him and that he brings these, he brought those gifts for those people, and then it connects so greatly to the gifts that we receive today, which always points us to Christ and his presence and grace. Yeah, no, I, I think so. And I think that, you know, there there is actually kind of like, for that reason, um, just just there really is like a place for, for using incense today, and then like even um, incense aside, just kind of something that like illustrates, I think the importance of something like, you know, just bread and wine, right. That like that wine has like a, a smell to it that like y- you need, we, we got to like, just, you know, we're, we're not just kind of disembodied uh, consciences or like, you know, just kind of floating around with I- ideas and propositions, right. Like, like y- you need to like anchor the senses in something, you know, and, and uh, th- this is, this is why it's like one of the reasons why it's such a blessing to, to have like these these sacraments that are these physical things that you can remember and have pictures of and point back to and and smell and and taste and 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 why it's a great thing to have that like in devotional life and like you know like one of the things that I found like for instance like with my daughters like you know like one and four um, they really like our evening devotions. Um, well, I mean, we do, we do the same thing in them and actually like all three times of the day that we do this, but we, we actually light a candle, like an actual candle. Mm-hmm. And, and they really mm-hmm. like that. Um, cause if you, a candle in particular, especially like, um, I mean, depending on the candle you get, um, they, they have a very particular look, you know, that's not like, a you know, an, an led screen. Um, it has a kind of scent. You can smell the burning, and sometimes the candle has a little bit of a scent to it, right? And they just they think it's awesome, and, and you know, and they get we let them blow it out at the end, which they think is amazing, right? And like those little kinds of things about ritual, they they, they kind of ground us, and and, and they kind of like keep it from getting too like hypothetical, right? Am I like am, am I worshiping in some kind of like abstract sense of like is my soul in alignment with God? It's like we can get real abstract, right? But but God, like he just lovingly just kind of keeps getting very concrete with us, you know, just just like a mm-hmm. like a father just, you know, gives his children gifts, gives him a hug. I mean, it's just, you know, keeping keeping it real and direct with his people. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, to go through this is a reminder once again that God is a God of order, that God is a God who brings his gifts and, and that he continually reminds us um, through physical things. And we can do that with our own churches, our homes, and everything that you're saying to remind us once again, all of this is fulfilled in Christ and his cross and resurrection. Uh, amen. And uh, just like with like the incense, right? I mean, you know, God, like, he, he was so, uh, he loved us so much that he, he was fine taking on like a, a human scent here in Exodus 37, right? <laughs> and, and kind of having, you know, and, and you're and taking these things from the ground, right? These different spices. And he was like, okay, I'll, you can, you can rub this stuff all over my, you know, my sanctuary. Right. And like, I, I don't mind your smell. Well, but just like you said, though, he takes on our scent when he becomes a human being, right? Like this is all this, this hinting at the incarnation that we get it fully in Christ showing us both. Um, yeah, that we that we need him, but that God is more than gracious enough for our need. Thank you, brother, for joining us. Glad the connection Thank held you. up. Looking forward to talking to you again soon. <laughs> yeah, God bless you. Everybody, that was Pastor Brady Finnern, uh, Finnern at Messiah in Sartell, Minnesota. Moving on You've to the next chapter. To Till then, everybody, I'm Pastor A.J. Espinosa. Peace. The Church, Missouri Senate Office of National Mission in cooperation with Worldwide KFUO, the official broadcast ministry of the LCMS. Your support is vital for this program to continue. You can make a gift safe, secure, and easily online at kfuo.org. Thank you for listening and supporting Thy Strong Word.